researchers, they found out that um, uh, among certain um, immigrant groups and the minority groups, when they live together, there seems to be positive health outcomes. So that's in contradictory with the, the segregation as fundamental cause of class disparity argument. So in this project, we are hypothesizing that uh, neighborhood racial diversity would uh, be positively associated with um, individual risk of metabolic syndrome because we have those four major um, hypothetical mechanisms. So one is diverse housing and mixed land use. So when we look at neighborhoods um, with um, higher racial diversity, they tend to be in uh, more urban areas uh, with different kind of, you know, uh, uh, building structure, so that promotes people to walk, like to grocery store or to bus station. So those are like non uh, non leisure physical activity, and the other one is ethnic food. So um, in contrast to the traditional American fast food, ethnic food tend to be lower in calorie. So we think that can help individuals risk uh, regarding metabolic syndrome. And then another one is prevalence of physical activity and obesity. So this is more like a subcultural environment. So if um, people living in your neighborhood tend to want more, say to bus station, to grocery store, that may influence yourself to want more. So that's more like a subcultural um, factor or influence. And the last one is stressor. So we know uh, minority-based discrimination. Uh, so when they live in a um, neighborhood with uh, um, diversity, better diversity, or like a, with groups of their own race ethnicity, maybe we think that they would face less discrimination, so they would lower their stress. Okay, and then in this project in particular, we look at so those potential modifiers, race, sex, gender, um, individual age, and also neighborhood poverty and uh, urbanicity, or whether they live in urban or rural areas. And then, um, so as I mentioned earlier, the data is from uh, National Health and uh, Nutrition Examination Survey. Um, we link the individual data to the census data. So that's how um, we come up with multi-level modeling. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there are five um, indicators of metabolic syndrome. Uh, so one advantage of using NHS data is um, so though all those five measures, they are objective measures in physical examination. So it's not like a self-reported survey. And then our measure for racial diversity is uh, the index of racial ethnic heterogeneity. So this is a measure um, similar to um, measures like a racial segregation or like a um, ethnic density. But um, this measure, we think they have been less used in the literature. That's why um, we here look at this measure. So basically, it's um, constructed based on the proportion of uh, those six groups in a neighborhood. And then um, at the neighborhood level, based on census data, we also measure poverty concentration and whether this neighborhood is in rural or urban areas. And then we control for individual socio-demographic variables. So the first part of the results, uh, we display the descriptive stats. So here I highlight those um, prevalence of um, metabolic syndrome across those social groups. Um, so overall, um, among U.S. adults, it's a little bit higher than 20% uh, regarding metabolic syndrome. But you can see um, men seem to have a little bit higher prevalence than women. But when you look at those um, specific indicators, it's very interesting that um, women seem to have a lower prevalence of high blood pressure, but they have a higher prevalence of waste obesity. I don't know if that's consistent with our own observation or experience. Um, and not surprisingly, when people get older, they seem to be have higher prevalence of metabolic syndrome. And also, it's uh, higher in rural areas compared to urban areas, because we hypothesize that people living in rural areas, they drive more, they want less. And then here um, is our multi-level modeling results um, from random effects uh, logistic model. 
So the first model is the full model without any interaction. Um, so I highlighted in red, it should, uh, this is um, coefficient, not odds ratio. So if it's negative, that means there is a negative correlation. So here it shows uh, increased ethnic diversity or racial diversity is associated with um, decreased risk of having metabolic syndrome. So that means racial diversity is good. So that's the overall uh, using full sample. And then we look at the interaction. So that's what I mentioned earlier. We look at the potential modifiers. Um, so we also tested uh, like um, individual um, sets between men and women and uh, between uh, rural areas, urban areas, but they are not significant. So we didn't um, show them here. So those two modifiers are significant in a statistical model. So it shows that um, this effect of negative correlation between racial diversity and uh, metabolic syndrome is particularly strong among blacks. So that means the positive influence of racial diversity is very significant for blacks in the United States. And then regarding the age interactions, it looks like middle-aged um, individuals, they seem to um, be significant for ladies compared to a younger adults. So that's our um, general results. Um, so this is consistent with our hypothesis, uh, saying that um, racial diversity is good, uh, not in other dimension or our social world, but also regarding individual health and uh, in metabolic syndrome in particular in this study. Uh, that's uh, especially uh, beneficial regarding racial groups for blacks. And the age interaction, this is a very um, interesting dimension to look at because uh, now people start to use a life course approach to study health outcomes. So, um, so how would the age modify the correlation between um, neighborhood environment and uh, individual health risk? So that's worth further exploring. So in tradition, especially when we search that look at uh, ethnic heterogeneity and uh, social relationship, there seems to be a negative connotation, saying that uh, when, there are, when the neighborhood is more diverse, the social cohesion seems to be lower. So that's in the literature. So um, in this study by Grip and Robert <coughs> Thompson, they start to um, call for need to reformulate the negative combination of the social uh, alternative of the racial heterogeneity or racial diversity. Okay. And then uh, here are some limitations of our study. So we use cross-sectional um, data. Uh, although one strength is that we use objective measure, but this still we suffer from causal inference. So in the future, um, if we can, we should be able to utilize longitudinal modeling and even that like, um, experiment to look at how um, neighborhood environment would affect individual health. And then um, self-selection, uh, endogeneity, that's also one of the major issues in looking at neighborhoods. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with endogeneity. So basically it says that um, some people, uh, if they are more, say, active, they want to live in a neighborhood closer to the rivers so they can buy a wall. So in that case, if you use cross-sectional data, so it's a uh, um, correlation, but it's not a causation. So that's what the endogeneity means. Probably up there, so we can get out. And then the very last thing, um, we didn't test for the potential mediators. So um, the major aim of this um, project is to look at the independent effect of uh, neighborhood racial diversity with uh, potential modifiers. So although we hypothesized some uh, mediators, but in this study we didn't, we were not able to test those um, mediators. So that's one of the limitations. So I think that's um, for my uh, research. And thank everyone. Uh, do we want to? No, we're going to save the questions okay. and thoughts for the end. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to move on to our next um, presenter, Thank you. Mario Sanders and... Um,
uh, Jennifer Malkowski. Is she, you're just doing it on her behalf as well. Um, the title of, of their presentation is The Agelessness of Knowing, a Rhetorical Critique of Metaphor and Biography Shift Past Medicalization. Welcome, Maria. Hello. <laughs> No, thank you. Um, so yeah, my name is Mario Sanders. I am an undergrad at CSU Chico, studying sociology and communication. Dr. Jennifer Malkowski is a communication scholar who teaches and researches at CSU Chico in the area of rhetoric and health and medicine. Um, so for this research, um, we looked at Viagra's Age of Knowing campaign. This was a multimedia campaign that included both um, television and print advertisements. Uh, however, for this campaign, we've mostly focused on the television ads. As far as we've been able to find, these ads aired from about 2011 to 2013. Um, we haven't been able to lock down specific dates yet. We've had to sign up for all these different services to get specific dates, and that's a process that we're still working through. But these dates of 2011 to 2013 are important because back in 2004, research showed that at that time, 18 to 45 year olds were the fastest growing user base, the fastest growing user base for Viagra. And this is interesting because 18 to 45 year olds are probably not the first age range we associate with erectile dysfunction, which Viagra is supposed to help with. Um, however, Dr. Malkowski and I argue that um, after this research came out, Viagra's all in my head. <laughs> uh, after this research came out, Viagra started to shift its campaigns to start including younger men in its target audiences. And so we use all um, sociological research specifically, I won't do that, um, specifically the research of Mika Lowe, who is a sociologist that studies Viagra and its connection to how people perceive it in regards to masculinity, um, as well as other researchers. However, Mika Lowe is the most prominent within our references. Um, and two significant themes appear uh, in the literature, and that is masculinity and compulsory sexuality and biomedical metaphors along with Viagra. And so compulsory sexuality, which is also referred to as the coital imperative, um, is this concept that a continuous active sex life is a necessary requirement for men to successfully achieve a normative masculine identity. And so Viagra was able to build on this um, by claiming that it is supporting men who want to continue this sort of active lifestyle but were previously unable due to experiences of erectile dysfunction. And um, the men in the research would talk about how before their Viagra use they felt as though something was missing and they felt as though they were less than a man because of their erectile dysfunction. And uh, so Viagra became a way for them, or Viagra became a way for them to preserve their manhood. Uh, the other significant, um, the other significant theme that appears in the literature is biomedical metaphors, and so this builds on the biomedical model of health, which puts emphasis on biological factors um, when looking at illness as opposed to psychological and sociological factors, and this is really pre prevalent in Western medicine, especially when looking at um, pharmaceuticals, and so, um, and this is because. Pharmaceutical companies are able to sell themselves to doctors in these metaphoric ways to explain their relationship, how their, how their pill is going to work in relation to the body. So one of the metaphors specifically talked, uh, talked about how the man who was experiencing erectile dysfunction was this broken machine and a car that was experiencing a dead battery and Viagra was the jumper cables. <laughs> so uh, an example like that shows how the relationship can be explained between Viagra and the male body. Uh, and because of our interest in this topic as persuasive communication, uh, Dr. Malkowski and I pull on the disciplines of communication and rhetorical theory to guide our method of analysis. And so Sonia Foss, who is a prominent rhetorical critic, defines metaphor as non-literal comparisons in which a word or phrase from one domain of experience uh, is applied to another domain. And this probably sounds fairly familiar to everybody. I'm sure we all took an English class a long time ago that, that probably explained that. But there's a significant difference between how the public, the general public thinks of metaphor and how rhetorical critics think of metaphor. And that is that 
typically the general public as the way that it's presented in English classes their descriptive language, their figurative language, and they sort of just paint a picture. Whereas rhetorical critics think of metaphors as generative, that they don't only describe something, but that they begin to shape our understanding of concepts through this metaphor uh, use. And we do this a lot, I'm sure, to the students who are in here. You've had a professor who was explaining something difficult and referenced nothing related to the area of sociology or whatever class you are in mm -hmm. to help you understand that concept and I'm sure the, the instructors of here have done something similar. So rhetorical critics argue then that thought itself can be understood as metaphoric. And so when looking at an analysis of metaphor um, from a rhetorical perspective, studying metaphor helps to identify and track how a speaker is able to shape the worldview of their audience by intentionally forging connections between different subjects, issues, etc. And so Dr. Malkowski and I um, combined the two by combining established sociological research on Viagra and masculinity and rhetorical criticism of metaphor. Um, we were able to examine the persuasive nature of this campaign and the way that persuasive strategies reaffirm particular gendered expectations about the intersections of masculinity, age, and sexuality. And so in our research, we found two significant themes and two significant metaphors within these ca this campaign. Um, themes of monogamy and heterosexuality around the characters that are present in the ads, and then metaphors of fixing broken technology and physical activity slash physical ability. Um, so the first theme of monogamy, um, the first theme of monogamy is uh, presented in the ads through the use of wedding bands. It's also presented in photographs of partners as well as text messages, but um, numerous ads use wedding bands as this still shows the, the wedding band on this man's finger to allude to the dyadic relationships that these men are in. Um, and so we might think initially that this goes against the common narrative of young masculinity. Young men are supposed to not want commitment and they're supposed to be trying to sleep with every, every woman that they possibly can. Um, however, the online college social life survey found that 71% of college men who were surveyed reported that they wished they had more opportunities for long-term partnership. So we can begin to think of this um, assumption of wanting to sleep with all these women more as a front stage presentation of self for young men. And so connected to monogamy is the theme of heteronormativity, um, because while the rings on the fingers don't indicate any orientation, the uh, pictures and uh, text messages do. Um, and so this still, um, from one of the ads, um, shows this man and this woman. And so in this ad, he's currently in his office, and he's looking at all of these images in his office. I think there's like one of him and his dog. There's one of him with like his work crew. And then there's one of him with this woman, uh, which then immediately shifts to him receiving a text message from Sarah, uh, to which he responds that he's heading home. And so while this woman could be anybody, it could be you know his sister, it could be his uh, friend, the context in which these images are presented by Viagra uh, insinuate the orientation of the men in the ads um, as being at least interested in sleeping with women. Uh, and this is subtle compared to Viagra's current campaign that uses female spokespersons. And so we see that as it really um, assumes the orientation of the men that are using Viagra. And so the first metaphor that we come across is that of technology, specifically broken technology that is then fixed by the characters in the ads. Um, yeah. Um, uh, so in this still, we see this man's car overheating in another on a beach um, where a man's trying to light a fire so that he can stay the night on the beach with his partner. His lighter breaks. And then in a third, uh, on a construction site, all of the lights go out. And so all of these could be presented as significant issues. I know when I was driving here on 99, if my, my car started smoking, I probably would have freaked out. Um, but uh, Viagra doesn't do that. Instead, they present these issues as simple inconveniences that these men have to experience. And they do that by presenting these men as prepared to um, fix these issues. Um, sorry. Um, 
And so this really presents how Viagra connects to this uh, stereotype among masculinity of being prepared and preparedness and that a man should be able to face anything. Um, and this also is, in this campaign is, oh, that picture got uh, subtle compared to Viagra's current campaign that focuses on its single packs and its on-the-go packs, which really say, like, there's absolutely no reason why you should ever not have this ready. <laughs> and so... Uh, <laughs> the next metaphor that we come across is that of physical activity slash physical ability. And so these are two separate ads, one in which this man is sailing his boat by himself, and another in which this man is surfing by himself. Uh, we also see uh, blue-collar workers represented, like construction workers and ranchers and farmers. So an active lifestyle is really foregrounded throughout this campaign. And this is then is connected to the agelessness that gets associated with normative masculinity that's re reiterated throughout um, Lowe's research. And um, one, of the, uh, one of her participants, when asked about how Viagra is connected to masculinity, responded by saying, it, Viagra, makes you closer to what the ideal man is supposed to be, young and virile. And so one of the sub-themes of this metaphor is that of independence. Um, all of these activities that these men are doing, whether it be jogging or sailing or even, you know, when they're fixing the technology, they do it by themselves, which goes to show that a man shouldn't really need to ask help from anyone else. They should be able to take care of these issues by themselves. Um, and so these two metaphors, physical ability and fixing broken technology, um, are both used in this campaign to represent uh, the vitality that we associate with young, passionate sex. And so I specifically talk about young sex because uh, one major misconception about uh, the elderly and elderly people in general, not just men but women as well, is that as one ages, their sexuality and sexual desires wane to the point of we think of them as asexual. And the men in the literature particularly uh, struggled with this. Um, because they felt these sexual desires and they wanted to talk about them with other people, but they were concerned about being labeled dirty old men mm -hmm. who were being inappropriately sexual for their age. Um, and so these metaphors then really establish young manhood as ideal, which then consequently positions old manhood as flawed. And this is not a new connection in terms of gender. Uh, agelessness and gender has been connected, however, in the past, I'd argue it's been more connected between youth and femininity in regards to beauty standards. Um, however, according to Viagra, men too should be clinging to their youth. Um, and so this then connects to how Viagra is uh, shifting away from medicalization. Because back in 1998, when Viagra first released, it had the job of medicalizing erectile dysfunction. And it was able to do so by building off of this compulsory sexuality uh, imperative. Um, However, nowadays, as we see it shifting not only to being associated with uh, erectile dysfunction, but now that Viagra is attaching itself to other stereotypes of normative masculinity, like preparedness, like physical ability, like independence, it no longer attracts men who are simply trying to help their erectile dysfunction, but it's attracting men who are simply looking to enhance their masculinity. And we see this in other ads as well. Um, I'm not going to try to play this, but uh, this, was, um, this was the Fiat commercial from the Super Bowl from 2015 where we see this older man accidentally throw his pill out the window and it goes on this wild adventure uh, until it eventually ends up in the gas tank of this Fiat, uh, which uh, we then see the Fiat get much bigger and we can assume more powerful. Uh, <laughs> And so this goes to show that, that, you know, that car was being filled up with gas, so it's, it has to be functioning fine, like it works. But um, it's going to show that this is how Viagra, Viagra is viewed by um, outsiders, that it's viewed as this way to enhance one's masculine identity. And so uh, Dr. Malkowski and I argue that um, if the men in these... Viagra ads were closer in age to the man that's in this Fiat ad who appears to be maybe in his 70s or 80s, whereas the men in the Viagra ads are maybe in their late 40s and 50s, uh, it would be interpreted significantly differently. 
Uh, it would also be interpreted significantly differently if uh, they weren't living this active lifestyle. If the men who were portrayed in the Viagra <coughs> ads, rather than sailing, surfing, and jogging, if they were, you know, sitting at their kitchen table reading a newspaper, or cooking, or even doing something that's maybe considered feminine, like knitting, uh, it likely would not attract the audience of younger men. Um, and so through these themes of monogamy and heteronormativity that assumes, the, uh, that assumes the identities of the men who are using Viagra and through the metaphors of fixed technology and physical ability, we see how Viagra is shifting away from medicalization and more towards this enhancement framework. Um, yeah, so thank you. Which one? The last one, it was... The Fiat commercial? Yeah, the Super Bowl... 2015. Thank you. That was good. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Um, Ashley Saki uh, will be presenting uh, on the nature of women in the sandwich generation. Thank you, Ashley, and welcome to the podium. Make sure I have this right. Let me the first one. Yeah. No, that's me. Sorry. Oh, I thought you had a system for <laughs> knowing what's on that screen. There you go. <laughs> Alright. Alrighty, and um, actually you have a timer right here. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. I guess that's it for everyone. Now that we've covered Viagra, I think we're going to talk about kids <laughs> and multiple generations. So my master's thesis was on caregiving and the sandwich generation, which in essence is when a man or a woman has to care for his or her elderly parents and children, no matter their age, at the same time. As we can see, multi-generational households are on the rise. And by 2020, we will see more than 55 million individuals over the age of 65. This is a list of some contributing factors, as we know them today. So longevity of people's lives, um, cost of formal caregiving, large population over 60, as I mentioned before, young adults still living at home during college and as well as moving back after college delayed marriage, having children later in life, and cultural obligation or expectation. For my research, I chose six main issues, which were gender, race, caregiver burden, couple burnout, financial burden, and health. Um, women, um, for the point of my research, I also did focus on women. Um, women make up most of the multi-generational caregivers in the U.S. and are also more open to expressing the need for help. There is strong correlation between women who care for multiple generations and problems with stress hormones and antibodies, along with a higher risk factor of multiple diseases and bad health habits. Researchers found that females who care for multiple generations in the same household tended to experience a decline in their, men a decline in their mental health, especially when they initially had to take over the care for both their children and elderly family members. The question I posed is, what is the nature of women in the sandwich generation? And I hypothesized that um, all of the previously mentioned variables will connect or contribute to a lack of support for the caregiver, whether it be from family, friends, or governmental agencies. I did a qualitative study with um, in-depth interviews of 15 female participants that ranged in age of 30 to 60 years old and were Caucasian, Hispanic, or African-American descent. I did distribute flyers in the following places um, in LA and Orange County. A majority of my participants were single and they did report that their marriage ended due to having to take care of their elderly family members. Mm -hmm. This was known as couple burnout. A majority of the participants also did lack personal time and space so caregiver burden, and then they weren't able to hold a full-time job. So a majority of my participants were lower to middle class. Only one was upper class, and she did have a full-time job. 
we can also assume she had more help as well. Um, not receiving enough help from family, friends, or government organizations was an issue as well. So some positive reports were that they all felt that even though this was hard to take on, that their children were at an advantage to live with their grandparents um, in the same house or close by. All said they would not change what happened. There was a lot of stress, but they would never say no to caregiving for their parents and, of course, their children. Um, all have found their own ways of coping, including organization, time management, learning to ask for help, um, and finding the positive and mundane tasks. So a lot of them reported that they took pleasure in doing the dishes, or someone who was in school said that they liked doing homework and found that as stress relief. Um, there were um, a lot of limitations, but a couple included that it was hard to find these participants. One, because I was only using 15, um, and then also because a lot of them were hesitant to share their stories. These interviews were two to three hours long, so they went very in-depth, and it was a very emotional process. Um, there was also limitations with ethnicity because they were, I only represented Hispanic, Caucasian, and African American. Um, for, after doing this research, couple burnout um, was su surprising to me because there was not a lot of research on it, but it is a huge factor that I found with my participants, uh, and that despite the stress of all of this, they wouldn't change it. And all of them had a very positive twist on their stories. So even though you could tell the emotions that flowed out and uh, maybe the negativity it caused in their marriage, they all put a positive spin on their lives. There was also lack of government help throughout um, each participant. Um, in conclusion, for further research, research, couple burnout, cultural and religious differences, and men in the sandwich generation are all topics that I would like to at some point cover, but um, this study was done in 2014 when I was in grad school at Dominguez Hills. Um, however, right now in 2017, um, I'll be working with my thesis chair to expand on couple burnout. I think it was, it's important because little research is done on it and it does show that it's a contributing factor to divorce. So even though divorce is down at the moment, with people aging, um, especially with the statistic I gave earlier, it could very well lead to, um, of course, more divorce and that number going up. So that's my thesis. Thanks. 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 Okay, and on to our last presenter, Heather. Hopefully you'll find your slides in, How does that, this all work? in that thing, in that mess. Um, her uh, presentation is titled, Aging Out of Residential Care with HIV and Hope, Are Nations Ready for This Unique Population? A case study from Jamaica. And welcome to the podium. Thank you. All right.